Welcome back, those of you who are returning. There's one or two of you I think are here for the first time. Um, so now that we're into our third session, I, I'll be just very quick about the logistics. Um, we have a washroom here, there's coffee there. Uh, the atmosphere we've had uh, here in these sessions has been pretty informal, so please feel free to go get a coffee if it becomes desperate. Um, I will be uh, facilitating uh, our session today, and the session number three, I'd like to just give a very brief recap of where we came from and, 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 and how we got to this particular subject. Um, so we kicked our six sessions off with an overview of a, of a sort of a problematic of a combination of crisis in our world of pensions, enormous unprecedented attacks on pensions, uh, and also these complexities of what pension funds have become, what pension funds are actually doing in the larger financial system. And we started by raising a number of questions about how this matches up with some of the ambitions and goals and strategies of the labor movement and, and others. Uh, that was that's a brief recap of the first session. Then we moved last session, two weeks ago, to an examination of I think one of the key subjects that is always going to be raised in, in uh, pension discussions, and that is the unions and other <coughs> social activists' interest in trying to exercise some sort of influence or even direct control over what pension funds do uh, and appeals for what ended up called socially responsible investments. Sometimes it was called ethical investment in the past. It's now more recently been shortened to just <coughs> responsible investment. And in fact, there's another flavor uh, more recently articulated. Uh, it, it, it will be reduced to an acronym of ESG, which stands for, uh, if I get this right, environmental, social, and governance issues to be integrated into the investment process. I got that right, ESG. Uh, so this was uh, a set of issues that we had our panel from last time examine and I would say critically investigate and in some ways critique, uh, both from an abstract and, and kind of theoretical level, but then also we heard from Catherine Cummins from Mining Watch who had, I think, a really interesting story to tell about a direct concrete example of uh, a complexity that her organization ran into in trying to make alliances with pension funds and investment funds that were ostensibly being responsibly governed and, and run. So that's where we left off last time. We're now moving, I think, in this session to something that is even more directly related to the pension funds themselves and the decision makers that, that oversee uh, the governance of these plans, and that is what we generally call the boards of trustees, the governing boards that make decisions. And the title which we gave this session, probably unfortunate, uh, I actually I can't remember, I don't have it in front of me, but it's, you know, it references fiduciary duty. Uh, actually, now I do remember the title, so I'm telling you, fiduciary duty, is this, a, is this a shield, a legal shield for corporate capitalism? Uh, unfortunately, I actually talked to a couple of people who said, yeah, this sounds not very interesting. <laughs> Fiduciary duty. Uh, and, and it's true, I, I have to say from my own experience within CUPE, you know, this legal concept of fiduciary duty as it's applied to pensions, immediately somehow the word and the concept itself leaves a lot of people's eyes glazing because it's obviously something that is not part of our everyday uh, jargon and language. Um, and it is something that trustees who end up serving both, not, not just from unions, named by unions, but all trustees who serve uh, in roles of decision-making authority over pension plans, have to come to terms with. Uh, I won't go on about it, because that's why we have these people, but I'll, maybe I'll just flag one point to, to, uh, to, to be a bit provocative and, and to 
And to demonstrate why this is an important subject, there's a, there's a number of reasons. But one of them, for those of us especially coming out of the labor movement or the workers' movement, one of the key messages that some in the legal community will offer to uh, pension trustees, and in particular trade union appointed or elected pension trustees, is that if you take on a role, whether you're named by a union or not, if you take on a role as a trustee, that, uh, that creates a whole other set of obligations and responsibilities that you are legally obligated to respect. And for some, this gets abbreviated into the, the notion that what you have to do if you're a union trustee is take your union hat off and leave it at the door when you come into the room and instead evaluate all of your uh, debates, discussions, issues from a, a kind of a technical perspective uh, without any sort of <clears throat> input or, or, or consciousness of the fact that you were named by a union or that maybe you're a member of a union or, or a member of the pension plan. So just, I, I think just that alone makes it obviously, if that's true of what I just said, if, if that is a common or dominant message in the industry that a lot of trustees face, I think we, a lot of us can instinctively think, well, this is important to understand, to investigate, to come to terms with, particularly, particularly if we have any sort of notion that having unions naming representatives to sit on governing boards of these pension plans, part of the expectation or the objective is to bring an influence that is shaped by the union itself. Obviously, this is an important uh, set of issues to, to come to terms with, and we have a, a, a terrific panel to help us uh, wrestle with some of these issues. Uh, I'm just going to maybe very briefly identify the panel, and then we'll, we'll just kick things off. Uh, first and foremost, we have Joanna Westar uh, with us. Joanna teaches at Western University of Western Ontario, uh, and I don't know enough of the details, so I'll ask her to help me, in the, the department of... Yeah, it's called uh, Dan Management and Organizational Studies. Management and Organizational Studies. Yeah. And form this is the last few years, you were at St. Mary's in a... The department of Management. Yeah. Department of Management, yeah. So, Joanna, uh, uh, we invited Joanna specifically because she has been working uh, as far back as 2004, she tells me, on a very interesting project of which, which I don't think anyone else has done that I'm aware of, certainly not in Canada, uh, to pursue research collaboratively with a colleague in Elverma from U of T, or OISE, U of T, um, to, to do primary research on the experience and perspectives of labor-appointed trustees on pension boards. And the two of them and others have published a series of articles based on that research. Uh, and so we've invited Joanna to share some of the results of that research in the context of this discussion that we're ha having uh, about these expectations and goals of the labor movement and so forth. Uh, and I think uh, um, one of her papers, the, the more recent one, was one of the recommended readings for today that I know a few of you looked at. 